Our guest today once held the highest position in education in the country. Dr. Rod Page served as U.S. Secretary of Education under President George W. Bush, and he was largely the force behind No Child Left Behind Act. Now Dr. Page is back in his home state of Mississippi, serving as the interim president of his alma mater, Jackson State University. Dr. Page, it's good to have you home. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you. Now, you're Mississippi, but you brought a little bit of Texas with you because you're <laughs> well, wearing your cowboy boots today. Well, I take them everywhere I go, actually. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you started out in education basically because your parents were educators, so you couldn't Absolutely. escape it, could you? I, no way, no way, absolutely no way. My parents were very proud to be teachers, mm -hmm. and so being a teacher was really something to aspire to, mm -hmm. and so we were kind of brought up to be teachers. Had to do our homework every night and everything like that, so I'm, I'm really proud of the way it, it happened for me. You grew up in Monticello? Your, Monticello, Mississippi. Your dad was a principal, your mom was a librarian. And my mom was a librarian. Actually, there were not many books in the school, but mm -hmm. uh, she was proud to call herself a librarian with the kinds of books that she could gather. So you kind of figured, okay, I want to go into education early on. Well, pretty much that's the way it was going to be. I was kind of raised to be that way. Actually, uh, I, I loved it. It, it, was, yeah. it, was a, it was a good to ask, to aspire to. So that led you to Jackson State University. Yes, Jackson State University. So it's funny how the circle goes full circle. Yes. You're back at Jackson State now. I never thought of it that way, but that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, but there's been a lot of wonderful stuff in between. Now, what did you graduate from at Jackson State? Uh, physical education. Mm -hmm. I, my aspiration was to be a coach. Actually, to be, well, I wanted you were to play coach. football. Yeah. That's right. I, mm -hmm. That's that's what I wanted to be. Yeah. A football coach, and that, that's where my aspiration actually stopped. I was just kind of pushed off into these other areas. <laughs> so you got to be careful sometimes, right? That's you never, right. You never know. You did go and get, you got your, you went to Indiana University. Also. Indiana University, right. Mm -hmm. What'd you do there? Uh, education and physical education. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and then you came back to Jackson State and you were a football coach. Well, actually, I left uh, Indiana University and went to the University of Cincinnati. Okay. Became an assistant football coach at the University of Cincinnati. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Talk about what it was like coming back to be the, the, the head football coach at Jackson State. Well, it was really interesting because you met a lot of guys. You know, at first, I was so much influenced by the coaches who coached me. Right. At Jackson State. Yeah. Uh, who actually led me to go to graduate school and get a degree. Coach Wilson was a basketball coach mm -hmm. and was a receiver coach in football. And I, I was one of the receivers. So Wilson's relationship with me uh, actually caused me to end up in Indiana University. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you coached there and then you, of course, uh, you coached at what, Cincinnati? Up in Cincinnati? Coached at the University of Cincinnati. Yeah. And so one day uh, I was hanging around the Cincinnati Bengals pro football mm -hmm. field. They actually played their games in the University of Houston, the University of Cincinnati Stadium. And so I got a chance to meet a lot of players from that, mm -hmm. from that, from that rim. And uh, I noticed that two of the players came from Texas Southern University. And uh, those two players told me a lot about Texas Southern mm -hmm. University. So I applied for a job there and was fortunate enough to get it. That was one of the largest historically black universities in the nation, wasn't At it? At that time it was, At yes. At the time it was. Mm -hmm. So that's how you got to Texas. That's and how I got to Texas. You, you went down there coaching. And I've heard you tell an amazing story about the time you were you were playing grambling at the Astrodome. <laughs> and um, it maybe didn't turn out quite the way you want to, but you had this great encounter with a lady afterwards. I've used that a lot in a lot of my speeches, and people think it's a joke. They think I'm kidding, <laughs> but it's actually the truth. We were playing grambling in the Astrodome. At that time, uh, really a special place to be. And we had 56,000 people in the Astrodome at that time. Was, we had the third largest crowd in the Astrodome history. Uh, it was a Billy Graham concert mm -hmm. at one time. Concert may be the wrong word, but Billy, Billy, Billy right. Graham presentation. Uh, and, and then we had a baseball game with Sandy Koufax pitching. And the third was the Texas Southern Grambling game. And uh, the Grambling game turned out we were on the wrong side of the scoreboard. So Coach Robinson got the best Coach of you Robinson that day. Coach Robinson got the best of us. And uh, carelessly walking out of the stadium, I bumped into this little old lady, knocked her purse on the ground, and bent down to help her pick it up. And I said to her, excuse me, ma'am, no offense. And she said, that's right, sonny, you had no offense. And I didn't care much about your defense either. <laughs> 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 and you're like, yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, ma'am. It sounds right. like she was not somebody you wanted to mess with. That's right. That's right. All right. So you're coaching, mm -hmm. and then you made the transition to teaching. How did you make that transition? Well, coming to Texas Southern University, I, I negotiated a deal that my contract permitted me to be a member of the faculty. Okay. Not just a coach. So I was a member of the faculty 
coaching. Mm -hmm. And being a member of the faculty, I was eligible to move up the faculty rank. And that's okay. how I became the dean of the College of Education. Yeah, you came up to be the dean. That's and right. So, I mean, I'm trying to think about your resume. Um, you've pretty much done everything in education but serve lunches. Well, you know, if I look back, I might could find some times when I did that also. <laughs> That's right. You probably mopped a few floors <laughs> and got everything else well, done. I did too. that when I was at Jackson State, mopped a few floors and things like that. Kids that had scholarships there also had jobs. That's not a bad idea, no, actually. I might want to try that again. That's a very good idea because mm -hmm. work is important. And, mm -hmm. and thinking about you getting that education, and then how did you go from being a college dean to getting involved with the Houston uh, Independent School District? Well, uh, in my private time, I was very active in the civic community. Mm -hmm. In fact, I became the, the president of the city club in the neighborhood where I lived. Right. And so I was involved in a lot of uh, municipal activity. Yeah, you kept a dump. You got rid of a dump in your neighborhood. That's right. Yeah. It's a major, major dump. And yeah. Matter of fact, we raised money, hired a law firm, and stopped the city from building a dump in our neighborhood. Okay, so basically you're somebody not to, be, to mess with, right? I was kind of a community leader. Yeah. Yeah. So you got involved actively. Of course, you were involved with education mm -hmm. already. So you got involved with, with doing the Houston Independent well, School District. Tell everybody a little bit about that. Well, district. actually, I had no plans to get involved with the Houston Independent School District. But during that time, Mickey Leland, who was a very popular mm -hmm. uh, uh, congressperson from Houston, was killed in a traffic in, a, in an airplane accident yeah. in, in, in uh, Africa. Yeah. And so that left that seat open. The lady who was on the school board resigned the school board seat to become a candidate for the 18th Congressional District congressional seat. And uh, that left the seat open. And the ministerial community and mm -hmm. the civic club community uh, came to me and asked me uh, to uh, go, go for the school board seat. And, and I finally agreed to do that. And that's how I was elected two four-year terms to the school board. Talk a little bit about the district. It's, it's an urban district, correct? It is an urban district. Uh, it was about, um, at that time, about 200 and 90,000 students. So about the, one of the largest districts the in the nation. The seventh largest yeah. school district mm -hmm. in, in the nation. Big employment base, but the yeah. thir third largest employment base in, in Houston at, at, wow. at, at that time. And so that school board was a, a strong actor in, in the, in the decision-making community, community in, in Houston, Texas. So you came into it. Did you have some ideas already on some changes that they needed to make? I have absolutely no ideas. Oh, really? From the beginning. From the beginning. Kind yeah. of like I'm beginning from the beginning to, to take it. At Jackson State, but I, I studied literature mm -hmm. pretty well. I made uh, trips to places where they were doing good work, right? Uh, and, and and interviewed a lot of people and, and kind of studied the situation and just learned. It was a kind of on-the-job training yeah. situation. So, so by the by the end of your second term, what were some things that you thought needed to be changed? Well, there's, we were considered a urban school district that was characterized by violence, yeah. student dropout, you know low academic performance, all the characteristics you would you think of in an urban school district. But right. one of the ones that bothered me most was, was violence and student yeah. dropouts. And so we did a lot of work to kind of smooth that out. Yeah, I'd seen where you actually helped the police force become certified. Right. Matter yeah. of fact, we kind of installed the Houston Independent School District Police Force. Yeah. Uh, with the, at that time, Mayor Lanier was the mayor of the city of Houston, mm -hmm. and he was very helpful. And I had a lot of chances to talk to him, and he gave me a lot of advice, really good advice. And so I learned a lot from how he, how he did his work and established a, the Houston uh, Independent School District Police Force. And that helped a lot. I, um, how did you make the transition from being on the school board to getting the top job? Did somebody just call you up one day and say, hey, how would you like this? Or would you throw your hat in the ring? Explain top job. Oh, being the superintendent. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't throw my hat in the ring. Okay. Uh, somebody threw the hat at you. Somebody threw the hat at me. That's right. Uh, our superintendent resigned in the mid-year yeah. to go back to his home, which is Broward County, Florida, mm -hmm. and become the superintendent there. And that left 14 months on his contract. And so the school board members came to me and asked me to resign my seat and, and take that uh, job for 14 months to fill out the end of his contract. And, I, and I, I agreed to do that. And it turned out to be almost eight years. Almost eight years. Mm -hmm. So be careful what you fit with. You know, those, these temporary jobs sometimes turn into a career. You said, and, and I, I lived in Houston at the time, in the Houston mm -hmm. area, and I remember it being touted as the Houston miracle mm -hmm. because the, the test scores turned around. Everything turned around. It was really an amazing mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. But you have a problem with the, the word miracle. I did, because a miracle is something that you can't explain. Yeah. I can explain what happened in, in, in Houston, in the independent school district. What did happen? It was hard work. Yeah. We got great teachers yeah. involved. We gave them special training. Mm -hmm. And we merged with the community and got a lot of individual community help. 
and we just did a lot of things that were supposed to be done right in the management side. Right. It was work that turned the Houston and Scuba District around. It was not a miracle. It wasn't from it was, above. It, it was. It, we had our head had from some, above, but we, we, did yeah, all, exactly. we did all the work. Yeah. Exactly. Talk yeah. about some of the things that you had, because, I mean, this, these were little building blocks <laughs> that later went into No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, the things that you had your teachers doing, and, and how did you get the community involved? Because well, for, one of the first things we did was establish accountability. Yeah. We, we established, the, starting with the superintendent. Yeah. I was accountable for the work that I was supposed to get okay. done. And we made a point that the teachers, too, were accountable for the work that had to be done. Right. We had this accountability flow all the way through the system, all the way down to parents. Mm -hmm. Parents have a certain accountability, too, that teachers can't make up for. Right. So we had established what we wanted to have happen. Mm -hmm. We established who was responsible for having to get, get happen, happen, provide them with the resources. And also, we made clear what would happen if it didn't happen. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, just a management situation right. where you get all the people involved. And, and when you get a lot of help from, as I did at that time, from the city council in, 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 in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. the Greater Houston Partnership, which involves what most people would call the Chamber of Commerce right. and other entities like that. And it became a citywide effort. So you had everybody mm -hmm. pretty much singing from the same hymnal. That's a, that's a good place to start. That's a very good place mm -hmm. to start. So how did you get on President Bush's radar? To, to become part of his administration? Well, I actually got on W's, yeah. the 43rd president, mm -hmm. radar, through 41. Really? That's true. That's who I they're really, from Houston. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on a committee that, that he was on also. Mm -hmm. And I met him and worked at his campaign. And uh, he then invited me to, to join him in his campaign. And later on, when his son ran for governor, he already knew me from the work I did with his father, and we formed the relationship there. Just quickly, talk a little bit about the character of both men. They're both pretty good guys, aren't they? Excellent human beings. Yeah. Very much like my father. Yeah. And that, I think, is what attracted me to them. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are solid human beings, and they want to do good work. They have good character. When you get the phone call saying, hey, would you like to be part of my administration, did you just kind of sit there and look at your wife and go, wow? Actually, I was doing the Christmas holidays, and I was with my whole family, so I shared that with them, and everybody was really shocked, as I was. <laughs> they were thinking, D.C., wow. And you, and you started, you, of course, made it through, you, you got confirmed. You were actually sitting in Booker Elementary School on the day of 9-11, weren't you? You, actually, were, there yes. with, you mm -hmm. were there with the president. I was talk there with the president. Talk <laughs> about that fateful day, because that's got to be something that will stick with you for the rest of your life. Actually, actually it will. We arrived... Uh, there mm -hmm. on the 10th, mm -hmm. and we had a dinner that night uh, for many of the supporters who had helped the president become elected, yeah. uh, get elected. Remember, we had a little snap up in Florida during that period of That's time. That's right. There were some hanging chads. There were some involved. hanging chads yeah. and other things like that. So we brought together a lot of leaders in Florida and had a little dinner that night. As usual, the president goes to bed early, so he kind of left the dinner, uh, and we were to meet in his in his uh, suite the next morning, real early, to go over the the program for that day. And so my role was to introduce the president, and which is the only part that I paid attention to, the only part that I really studied. We got in the cars and drove to the school, crowded on the side of the roads, people just fl waving flags and waving. <clears throat> we got there, the president got out of the car her first, went in the room, and when he went in the room, I saw Andy Card on the phone, and the card was his chief of staff. I had to call my office, so I pulled out my cell phone. The person in the, in the communication room said to use one of the secure phones. Wow. And so I went over to use the phone. I'm standing beside Andy Card, who's talking on the phone with no expression on his face. And so uh, then the lady came and said, it's time to go in with the kids. I had no idea what was going on. The president was sitting in front of the classroom. The lady was interviewing him. When Andy Card came in the room, and bend over to talk to the president. The president didn't say anything, but just kind of looked up at him. And then Card stood back up, and the president looked at him for just a few minutes and then went back to reading. Yeah, because he didn't want to scare the kids. When he finished that, we go into the auditorium where, where, the, where the, everybody's assembled. It's about 300 people in the auditorium yeah. with all the press and everything. And uh, he's, when he passed by me, he said, Rod, you got to handle this. i got to go. Wow. Still, I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he made some comments to the uh, press that we are under attack and punched me and I had to go out and do the No Child Left Behind 
story. <laughs> and so your mind was probably a million places it from... It was a million places away. Yeah. And finally, two people touched me on the back and said, come with me. And that's when I learned about what was going on. So you're, you finally managed to hitch a ride back to Washington at that point. About and two so, days later. So, wow, mm. that, has, that had to be incredibly mm. powerful. Mm. Mm experience. No Child Left Behind, and that was that was a very early initiative in, in the Bush administration, and I mean, that was literally like within the first few weeks and the first hundred days, but it was an interesting coalition. I mean, you even had Ted Kennedy come into the White House on that one, so you, you y'all really worked hard to get a, a bipartisan approach on that, didn't The president you? had been working on that for some time. Actually, yeah. that was his key initiative when he went to Washington. Yeah. We didn't plan to, to get involved in 9-11. Right. He planned to work on education. That's right. We were sworn in. Uh, he was inaugurated on the 20th. Yeah. That was a Saturday. And I think it was Monday or Tuesday, we had a proposal for No Child Left Behind to the Congress in, in the proposal language. Yeah. So we had been working on it for some time. So you <laughs> y'all were ready, ready to hit the ground in 100 months. Talk a little bit about No Child Left Behind because you had seen in Houston when you were there firsthand what happens when kids literally got left behind. Well, when we got to Washington, the No Child Left Behind, which was the current iteration of the uh, bill that had been, that preceded it called Improving America's School Act of 1992. That's right. That was President Clinton's bill. Mm -hmm. uh, it should have been uh, redone two years earlier, but the president had gotten into a little problem that it- He was distracted. Of, he was distracted, <laughs> He yes. was distracted. So we knew that we had to put that to work. So yeah. we did it, actually a lot of cut and paste from the previous bill and added our ideas to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what became the No Child Left Behind Act. A lot of accountability, a lot of, t a lot of testing and so forth, getting metrics. Well, actually we took the ideas from yeah. the previous bill called Improving American Schools yeah. Act and made it stronger. Right. Added more accountability to it. Right. Your four years you were up in Washington, that obviously is one of the highlights, the No Child Left Behind. Talk about some of the other memories you have up in D.C. Uh, I think the most vivid memory I had in D.C. is happened in the first couple of months. I couldn't believe that I was there. <laughs> I had attended two cabinet meetings, and my mind was just blown. I'm sitting at the cabinet of the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting five rows down from the President of the United States. I'm from Monticello, Mississippi, what am I doing here? It really took me a while to get adjusted to that. And you know what really turned me around? We were driving from my office to the White House, and I saw a yellow school bus parked on the side of the road. It had the hood up. <laughs> and I know what happens when, you, when a school bus doesn't make it to school. And I look at that school bus and say, you know what? This is a different world I'm in now. I need to do something different here. And that's how I kind of adjusted to being the United States Secretary of Education <laughs> instead of being the superintendent of the Houston schools. Because right. the first two months I was operating like I was a Houston school superintendent. But I made a transition there and that's how I really got it going. You made the transition. Of course, by the time he was elected for a second term, you mm -hmm. decided, okay, well maybe it's time to, to, to head back home. And you, do you, go, you went back to Houston. I actually went to Dallas. You went to Dallas, I, okay. I worked for a private company there. Uh, in, in Dallas. Okay, for, that, for that's enough to get you in a fight in, in, in Texas if I, you know, said Houston <laughs> when you really went to Dallas because there was a little absolutely. bad blood between the two absolutely. cities. Absolutely. So how was that? Houston considers Dallas a suburb of Houston. That's what I hear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're very, very, a lot of pride in mm -hmm. Texas. Working for the private company, what were some of the things that you did? It was a for-profit education company. Okay. It eventually uh, owns a company called the American College of Education. Yes. Which trains teachers. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a for-profit college. Right. And I worked for them for a while. What brought you back to Jackson State? I was here for the Southern game last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the Alumni Association. And it was a wonderful experience, except we didn't win the game. It was only about three or four days after that game that I got a call, which uh, brought me back to, back to, to, to mm -hmm. Jackson State. I had no idea that anything like that would ever happen until that day. 
when you got the call to come back and you, you realize you're going to be interim, so it was going to be for a few months, but did you understand that maybe some, that some of the challenges? That Absolutely were... not. I had no <laughs> idea whatsoever about that. So and I kind of like an on-the-job training. Yeah. I've learned a lot since I've been here. There was no book on how to operate this. What are some of the challenges that are facing? Because it's a, it's a great university <clears throat> with great people. What are some of the challenges let's, let's that are facing? Let's start with that. I think yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the key. Yeah. It's a marvelous university. Mm -hmm. It has a highly talented faculty, exciting students. Yeah. The facilities are just magnificent. Uh, it's, it's a great place. Right. But what has happened is uh, the accounts receivables, money coming into the university, uh, is, is much less than the money going out of the university. And it's created a gap there that has to be filled by reserve funds, which we know has been spent down. And so. This is the big challenge that we have, bringing that balance back together and, and bringing the financial support that will support the creative initiatives that are going on educationally, which is the, right. main, the main mission of the university. Yeah, so you and, and some, some other folks, you're having to sit down and take looks at different things like, you know, the, the outside campuses like mm -hmm. in Madison or mm -hmm. in downtown or stuff like that. You just have to basically take a look at We're everything. We're looking at where the expenditures are. Right, exactly. Where, where are the big hits? Uh, as far as the financial expenditures are. Right. How do we get this back in balance with the income that comes into the university? So your, your goal, your mission, is to leave it in sound shape for, for whoever takes the reins. That's what I'm working on, actually. Yeah. So creating in a way so that the university can bring in a stellar leader who can take the university to its rightful place. I really honestly don't ever picture you totally retiring. Well, I mean, you're a young guy, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, but you, you have to get that straight because that, oh, that, there's going to be a time when that happens. Okay, I didn't know. <laughs> is, there, is there getting a little bit of uh, maybe a little pushback from maybe home or something that maybe you need to come back? No, it's just some things that I want to do. You know, okay. i got to work on my golf game and i got to do those things like that. Golf <laughs> but, is important. That's so right. That's definitely important. So you would do some golf. Have mm -hmm. you thought about writing a book or writing? Well, I thought about writing a couple of other books. I've, I've written two already. Yeah. So I have a couple of other things in mind that I'd like to do. Yeah. I, I, there are some things that I like to do. So how does it feel to go through Monticello, Mississippi and see the middle school named after you? Oh, it's, it's such a fantastic experience to do that. It, it's almost chilling when I see that happen. I remember my middle school days would have never predicted that this would have happened to me. <laughs> All your teachers are, were sitting around in shock saying, wow, That's absolutely right. On, right. on right. that. That, that is, um, it's very good, and it's good to have you back home. Talk a little bit about education today, and I know you have some very strong opinions about that, and, and I think you and I both agree on the fact that the Founding Fathers said that we have to be an educated populace to be able to make good decisions when it comes to our government. What are some ideas that you would like to see pushed out into the education arena right now that's probably not being done right now? Well, there's been a lot of things written uh, yeah. about how to improve education. Yeah. There's some things that I think that we still need to improve on. Right. One is uh, that uh, parental situation with yeah. our parents. Uh, I think that that could be improved considerably. Well, you said yeah. holding them accountable. How do you hold parents accountable? Because I think that's, that is very, very important for them. It is very important, and very important and very difficult to do in yeah. many cases. In some cases, parents are very eager to, to, mm -hmm. to do that. In some cases, they just need to know what to do. Right. And in, in other cases, we need to find resources, and resources in terms of time, not necessarily just about money. Right. And resources in terms of ways to help parents. Parents now uh, have different responsibilities than parents had when I was a kid. Many parents have really complex job situations, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes many of the low-income parents have double jobs and things like that. So time is really an, an issue. That, that's got to be straightened out, too. We've got to find more efficient ways to do these things. Uh, any thoughts on curriculum or what's being taught, a school choice, some other ideas that you have? Well, obviously, I believe that uh, school choice is a necessary condition for a really effective education system. Right. Just like you have choice for everything else. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely very few things in the world where we don't have choices. Right. And we shouldn't uh, say that uh, a child should be chained to a specific school. The child should be free to attend a school that meets their needs. Right. Parents should have the right to make those kinds of choices. And that, that should be a positive way to do it. I, I, I'm really saddened by how that, could, that positive choice could be captured into political problems. Yeah, politics. It's, mm -hmm. that, it's an interesting mm -hmm. one, politics and education mixed mm -hmm. together a little mm -hmm. bit. Any thoughts about how kids are taught or anything like that that you would like to see changed? 
Well, uh, I think that the teacher is probably the most important right. part of this whole idea of, 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 of improving education. Right. And teachers are, can be very creative by the way they present, the, the, pre present their work to kids. And so I kind of leave that to, to teachers to do that. Right. We want to get great teachers who, first of all, care about That's right. student learning. Yeah. want to help student learn and, and, and are willing to do those things that are necessary to help students learn. Dr. Page, I just any closing thoughts uh, as we wrap up the show? I, I would just like to see us as a nation put more emphasis on, uh, let's say, realize the importance mm -hmm. of education. We do so in many cases about uh, economics of it, but I think education is important in many other ways as well. For example, uh, our political system mm -hmm. depends upon a learned population of voters. Right. And so the more people are aware of the issues and can analyze the issues and think through the issues, the better we can make these political decisions and the better our government can work. So education is really, I think, one of the most important things that we could do. Dr. Page, it's good to have you home and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.